Blessed morning. Welcome in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Pastor John Ellingworth here from St. John Evangelical Lutheran Church of Waverly, Iowa, bringing you today's readings and prayers from the Treasury of Daily Prayer. Today is Friday, April 5th. It is Friday after Easter. You'll find today's readings in the Treasury on page 198. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our psalm today is a portion of Psalm 145. Martin Luther says the following about the 145th Psalm. The 145th Psalm is a psalm of thanks for the kingdom of Christ, which was to come. It strongly urges the high, exalted work of praising God and glorifying his power and kingdom. For Christ's kingdom and power are hidden under the cross. If the cross were not extolled through preaching, teaching, and confession, who could ever have thought of it, to say, no to say nothing of knowing it? But such is the kingdom and the power that he aided the fallen, called the needy to himself, made sinners godly, and brought the dead to life. Yes, he is the one who gives food to all, who hears the call of his saints, does what they desire, and protects them. That's Martin Luther speaking on the 145th Psalm. We are now going to read verses 1 through 9, Psalm 145, verses 1 through 9. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another, and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty, and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness, and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. This is the word of the Lord. It says somewhere in the Confessions that the highest worship of God that we um, poor sinners can give, the highest worship we can give, it's actually not to give it all. It is to receive, to receive his gifts. And this psalm is extolling all that God has done. It's all about God. It's not about us. And um, the reason we worship God, the reason we praise God, the reason we um, glorify God, the reason we tell others about God is because of who God is and what he has done for us. Um, so the Christian faith in life is so much about remembrance um, of the God's faithfulness, his promises. That's what we put our hope and our trust in, that he has never failed us in the past, and he will never fail us in the present or the future. Uh, as a matter of fact, if God has said it, you might as well consider it done. And so that gives us hope, and that gives us strength through very difficult times where we can't see clearly what the path is for us. We can still trust in the Lord, that he knows what is best, and that he is working all things for our good. Uh, and that gives us incredible courage and strength and even joy uh, that we can share with others and encourage them on their journey as well. All of this glorifies the Lord when we share with others what he has given to us. Uh, that is the highest worship of God, receiving his gifts and then extending them outward uh, toward others as well. Our Old Testament reading is from Exodus chapter 18, verses 5 to 27. Exodus 18, verse 5. Jethro. Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife to Moses in the wilderness where he was encamped at the mountain of God. And when he sent word to Moses, I, your father-in-law Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and her two sons with her, Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and bowed down and kissed him. And they asked each other their welfare and went into the tent. Then Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake all the hardship that had come upon them in the way, and how the Lord had delivered them. And Jethro rejoiced for all the good that the Lord had done to Israel, in that he had delivered them out of the hand of the Egyptians. Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, and out of the hand of Pharaoh, and has delivered the Egyptians from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all the gods, because in this affair they dealt arrogantly with the people. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and sacrifices to God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law in, uh, father before God. All right, I want to say something here. I've made this point before that Jethro is a priest of Midian. So he's a priest. He's a priest of the Midianites. 
And the Midianites are not Hebrews. They worship other gods, perhaps multiple gods. I, don't, I honestly don't know off the top of my head what gods the Midianites worship. An easy search in a commentary would bring that up for you, of course. Um, this is not a Bible study. This is daily readings and prayers out of the treasury. So I, I can only share with you what is in my mind at the time, you know, and, and my own knowledge without digging deeper into the commentaries. I would do that for a Bible study, but not for the daily readings and prayers. So um, I don't know what gods the Midianites worship, but priest, uh, Jethro was priest of them. Jethro, nevertheless, recognizes the God of Israel, um, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, um, as being greater than all the gods of the Midianites. And really, Pharaoh recognized the same thing. Um, it's not like they stopped worshiping the Egyptian gods, um, but they also recognized the God of Israel as being higher. And this is replete throughout the scriptures. You know, um, the Romans really had no problems with the Jews and their God. Um, they worship many gods. What's, what harm could there be if there was one more from a, from a Roman perspective or a Greek perspective? For instance, they have a pantheon of gods. What they really had a problem with, with both Jews and Christians, was the exclusive nature of their God, that he was the only God that was to be worshipped. And they actually called Christians and Jews atheists because they did not believe or confess or worship the pantheon of gods of the Greeks and the Romans. So, we see here that uh, Jethro, and I'm not saying Jethro's a bad guy. I'm just saying that he's really not uh, a worshiper of the God of Israel in ex in the exclusive way that the first commandment um, recognizes that you shall have no other gods before me. But he does give credence to the God of Israel after this Exodus delivery as being greater than all the gods. Jethro said, verse 10, I'm sorry, verse 12, 13 now, the next day Moses sat to judge the people and the people stood around Moses from morning till evening. When Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, what is this that you're doing for the people? Why do you sit alone and all the people stand around you from morning till evening? And Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a dispute, they come to me and I decide between one person and another and I make note them know the statutes of God and his laws. Moses' father-in-law said to him, what, are you, what you are doing is not good. You and the people with you will certainly wear yourselves out, for the thing is too heavy for you. You are not able to do it alone. Now obey my voice, and I will give you advice. And God be with you. You shall represent the people before God and bring their cases to God, and you shall warn them about the statutes and the laws and make them know the way in which they must walk and what they must do. Moreover, look for able men from all the people, men who fear God, who are trustworthy and hate a bribe, and place such men over the people as chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and tens. And let them judge the people at all times. Every great matter they shall bring to you, but any small matter they shall decide themselves. So it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burden with you. If you do this, God will direct you, and you will be able to endure, and all this people also will go to their place in peace." So Moses listened to the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he had said. Moses chose able men out of all of Israel and made them heads over the people, chiefs of thousands of hundreds of fifties and tens, and they judged the people at all times. Any hard case they brought to Moses, but any small matter they decided themselves. Then Moses let his father-in-law depart, and he went away to his own country. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, brings to Moses a uh, piece of advice saying, hey, Moses, you're going to wear yourself out by you hearing all the disputes and the quarrels of your people. What you need to do is appoint chiefs um, from the tribes of the people and uh, let them handle those smaller disputes and um, the big disputes they can bring to you. And we, we, what we really see here is like the very infancy of the priest system, right? Where you have the great high priest and then you have all the priests working under him. And um, and in the pastoral ministry today, you know, no one man can serve all, right? And so God has provided pastors of congregations throughout the world. And uh, that way God's people are served and um, and cared for and uh, the, the and taught God's word and received into communion, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it was a good uh, proposal, and Moses took it to heart and implemented it. Our New Testament reading is from Hebrews 12, 1 to 24. Hebrews 12, 1 to 24. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, these witnesses 
are the saints that we heard in chapter 11. Um, people like uh, Abel and, um, and Abraham and Isaac and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Enoch was mentioned, right? Uh, all of these different examples of faith. Since we have their example is what he is saying here. Therefore, we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Well, if that doesn't sound like Paul, what does it sound like? Paul's always talking about running the race. The Christian faith is like a race or some athletic competition. Looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So the, the analogy of the race is that um, the goal of running a race is to cross the finish line. Uh, I know in our modern way of thinking, the goal of running a race is to cross the finish line first and to win the prize. But in this race, the Christian faith and life, the goal is simply to cross the finish line with your faith intact. Uh, everyone who crosses the finish line, first, last, middle, whatever, wins the same prize, and that is forgiveness and eternal life in Jesus Christ. Uh, so we run the race for the purpose of getting the prize. Um, verse 3 Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives." Paul is talking about suffering and tribulation and temptations that we will certainly face on our Christian faith in life as we run the race. Because of the hope that is set for us, and that is eternal life and forgiveness, the prize, if you will, we have strength to endure through whatever um, befalls us, knowing also that the Lord allows these things to befall us because he loves us. He is They are disciplined, they are training, they are teaching, uh, making our faith stronger, more focused on him, more balanced, more balanced more focused on the cross, I should say. Verse 7, it is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. This is why St. Peter says, don't consider it uh, something strange happening to you when trial and tribulation would befall you. But this is the discipline of God. God is treating you as his children, as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness by those who have been trained by it. Well, it's so true when we're children that we never like discipline. We don't see the goodness or the wisdom in it, but as we grow up and become parents ourselves, do we not discipline our children in the same manner that we were disciplined? Quite often we do, and we see the wisdom and the love that was in our parents' discipline all along. Verse 12 Therefore, lift up your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Strive for peace with everyone and for holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many people become defiled. That is, no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them, for they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels and festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn, who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
wow, what a powerful passage that is. Um, so we haven't come to a mountain that can be shaken. That's Mount Sinai, the mountain of the law of God, uh, which was shaken with earthquakes when God appeared in a blazing fire and darkness um, and a voice from God that was unbearable for the people to hear. They were terrified. But we've come to the heavenly Jerusalem, um, Zion, Mount Zion. That's the, the mountain of the Lord, uh, the, the, that the mountain of the law was preparing us for. And um, I think there's something to this. I, I, I never really thought about it before, then, but these last words where it names uh, the angels in festival gathering, the assembly of the firstborn enrolled in heaven, uh, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to the meteor of a new covenant, to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than Abel. I think that has taken us back to chapter 11 again, when we heard about the faith of Abel and the faith of Abraham and the faith of Enoch and the faith of Noah and all of these saints that have gone before us. Um, in a way, these things in this last passage here relate to them. The meteor of a new covenant through Moses, right? And through Noah, the, the blood of Abel is mentioned. Um, the, the enrolled firstborn um, could be a reference to Enoch. I'm not saying definitely that it is, but um, I don't know. That just hit my mind this morning as I was reading those words. Wow, the spirit came to me. I'm kidding. No. Um, moving on, our writing today is from Cyril of Jerusalem. Would you be persuaded that Christ willingly went to his passion? Others who do not know of their death beforehand died unwillingly, but he spoke before his passion. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. Do you know why his friend, this friend of man did not shun death? It was so the whole world would not perish in its sins. Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed and shall be crucified. And he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And would you know with certainty that the cross is a glory to Jesus? Hear his own words, not mine. Judas had become ungrateful to the master of the house and was about to betray him. Having just gone forth from the table and having drunk his cup of blessing, in return for that draught of salvation, he sought to shed righteous blood. He who did eat of his bread was lifting up his heel against him. His hands had but recently received the blessed gifts, and presently for the wages of betrayal, he was plotting his death. Being reproved and having heard that word, you have said it. He again went out. Then Jesus said, The hour has come, that the Son of Man should be glorified. Do you see how he knew the cross to be his proper glory? What should Isaiah, what, should Isaiah not be ashamed of being sawn apart, and Christ should be ashamed of dying for the world? Now is the Son of Man glorified? Not that he was without glory before then, for he was glorified with the glory that was before the foundation of the world. He was ever glorified as God, but now he was to be glorified in wearing the crown of his patience. He did not give up his life by compulsion, nor was he put to death by murderous violence, but of his own accord. Hear what he says, I have power to lay down my life, and I have power to take it up again. I yield it of my own choice to my enemies, for unless I so choose, this could not be. He came, therefore, of his own set purpose to his passion, rejoicing in his noble deeds, smiling at the crown, cheered by the salvation of mankind, not ashamed of the cross, for it was to save the world. For it was no common man who suffered, but God in man's nature, striving for the prize of his patience. That is from Cyril of Jerusalem. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you show those in error the light of your truth that they may return to the way of righteousness. Grant faithfulness to all who are admitted to the fellowship of Christ's church, that they may avoid whatever is contrary to their confession and follow all such things as are pleasing to you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Have a blessed day. We'll see you in the morning.